taking art out of wood, uh, I, I think it goes deeper. You need to um, really be in tune with the underlying structure to, to, to make something that's harmonious. And because you have something that's already beautiful, and you're trying to develop that beauty without without damaging it. There's 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 information that's encoded in that grain that that stores something about the the history of the tree, the the climate around it. So there's there's a lot of data, and having access to that data kind of make, makes you smarter. It augments you. Um, because your, your, your subconscious uh, so, so somehow works with that in, in, in ways that you're not necessarily aware of. But m when, when you're moving a knife through this cloud of data, that, that, that's, you're, you're smarter than if you just sit down and think about what would I do if I was cutting wood because you have the tactile interaction with it. So thinking about video games, I'm thinking, is there an analogous kind of grain that that we need to we need to pay attention to when we're making art with software, and yeah, there's there's a lot of actually different structures overlaid because video games are made up out of code and people that play them, what's going on in the player's mind, and graphics, sound. Every, there's lots of structure going on, and. It's running on hardware, on an operating system on hardware that's been made by other people. In, in a way, when you're when you're writing code, you're collaborating with the the engineers who built the compiler and, and so on. And everything in there carries carries information. Um, so I'll, I'll think about code for a while. Um, it's it's partially a, a, a man-made structure that we, we build programming languages as tools for a task, but it's, in a way it's not entirely man-made because uh, the underlying mathematics dictates what we can and can't do, or what we can and can't do efficiently. If, something, if something's an NP-hard problem or whatever, then it's going to take a lot of operations, whatever programming language you use, whatever, whatever universe you live in, if something's hard, hard for a computer to do, then it's just hard. Um, so this, this gives a kind of structure that underlies what we can do with software, makes certain things easy to do because they're, they're easy for a computer to do, or also easy to do in terms of like how many lines of code or how, how, how complex the code you have to write is. Um, and I... I think if something you can do without without giving the computer much effort or without having to write difficult messy code, if, if something requires code complexity, then it's probably less likely to be beautiful than than something that you can do simply in, in an elegant kind of way. Uh, this this isn't a, an exact correspondence. I, so sometimes, sometimes something um, that is simple to do is going to be messy and confusing and ugly. And it's something sometimes that something that's hard to do is worth worth doing. But you need to you need to be smart about how you're going to put that effort in. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I think about the what what one of the things that make up the grain of video games is. What what's natural to do with code, and so I, I like to try to when I'm making something try to do what seems like the simplest possible thing, um, but it so it's kind of hard to always perceive what the simplest thing to do is. Um, it's actually easier to come up with complicated, messy designs than it is to come up with a really simple one. And so you have to often start complicated and cut, cut things out, delete things until until you actually have a design that's good. And game jams are a good way to do this, to 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 develop this skill. I find uh, because when you're under a time constraint, you can't brute force your way to something interesting by by writing a thousand pages of code. You have to figure out what's what's natural to get a computer to do and just 
follow the, those contours. Um, so one, one example, I, I was thinking about AI. It's, it's hard to make a computer intelligently act like a human. In principle, it might be possible, but we can't really do that. So if, if you have a game design that says, I want the computer to do something that a human would think of here, you're going to be disappointed almost every time. You can maybe make an illusion for a while, but then you get something like the, the AI doesn't really know how to use ships properly in, in civilization or whatever. Um, and e even uh, in some games, like RTS games, the computer can often be the human player in a way that feels unfair by acting faster than our reflexes can, can handle. And that, that's less satisfying than if it was able to outthink you like a human. So I, I feel like if you, if you need behavior to be human, then you may as well just make it a multiplayer game. Leave, leave human behavior up to humans. And if you're, if you're relying on some sort of AI, then whatever you do, the AI is going to be exploitable. People are going to figure out how to exploit it. Why not design these exploits in so that, so that they'll be interesting to do, rather than leave it up to where our code went wrong? Um, here's a game by Tom Fraser called Mouse Maze. Um, the player designs the map and the mouse solves it with a really stupid algorithm. Everywhere it goes, it leaves a trail of piss. <laughs> and when it gets to a corner, it smells each of the possible directions and it goes where there's the least scent. And this will work eventually. It'll eventually get to the exit because the trails will build up everywhere else except the path to the exit. But you can trick it. You can make it leave a trail and then go out, and then it won't want to go back into its cabin and it'll go around in circles for a bit before it, before it wants to go back in there. So you, you, your goal is to, to trick the mouse for as long as possible. Basically, you have a bad algorithm and you're finding the least optimal input for it. And to, yeah, it's exploiting stupid AI, and it's, it's interesting to do. Actually, uh, the, 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 best, the best solution I found for this was to get a computer to <laughs> find a map for it as well. So setting the computer against itself. So maybe that's not the best example, but hey. Uh, this is my game, Zaga 33. It's, it's basically a stealth roguelike. The, every enemy type has a stupid, predictable behavior that once you figure it out, you can exploit it. And it's not a game about killing things. You can kill things, but getting in fights will, will drain your resources very quickly. Uh, to actually win the game, you have to be smart about it and outwit the enemies. And often, even when there's a room full of 20 enemies, if you know how they act, you can just outwit them, walk right past them to the exit without taking many hits and without having to actually kill anything, which is good. Killing in games is kind of boring. Um, yes, uh, in, in some other ways this game's a good example of following the path of least resistance or whatever, because it was made in a jam, so I didn't have time for anything complicated. Uh, all the items are one-off use, so I don't need any complicated interfaces for I'm going to put on this armor now. And the, the, the map generation is interesting. It, it just places walls completely at random and then checks if there's a path to the exit. If not, it throws it away, tries again. It's the, the simplest possible thing you could do, but it produces interesting results. And yeah, it's, it's really annoying when you prototype something complicated that took, took a few days to code, and then you realize that something you could have done in half an hour was better, and you have to throw it all away. But it often happens for me. Um, okay, so this, there's something else that's interesting working with, with program code, so that sometimes it goes wrong. We get bugs. And 
thinking about the analogy of wood grain, I think of these as like knots in the wood, which are where it grows out and has an awkward twisted structure that sometimes you want to cut it out, work around it, replacing it with something more, more straightforward, but sometimes you can incorporate it into your design to make something that's more beautiful. So I made this game called Game Title for one of the pirate cats. It's a simple adventure game, you explore, avoid enemies, whatever. Anyway, it turned out there was a bug in it. Uh, between levels, it didn't properly clear the memory. So the contents of the previous level could affect the one you're on. Just for one frame, if you occupied the, the same coordinates where in the last room there was an item, you could pick it up. And this seemed, this seemed really interesting to me. So rather than fix it, I, I actually made a whole a sequel called, called Lost Levels that, that sets up complex puzzles where you're trying to get in the right place in the previous room to, to be able to pick up, pick up an item. And yeah, I, I took advantage of other things that were slightly weird about the engine as well, that if you walked onto a wall from over the edge from another room, then you could stand on walls. And that was, yeah, just weird stuff like that. Um, yeah, eventually I made another kind of sequel called Corrupt, which is coming back to the same idea again, it, but instead it puts the player in control of how the level loading code breaks. Uh, you get to choose a lot of tile from one level to save that will stay there until the next level. And having that choice it makes for a lot more interesting puzzles because there's just a wider possibility space. In, in general, if you want to make something deeper, just give a choice of positions. It increases the, the branching factor compared to just like moving left, right, up, down. Uh, when there's more options to choose from, it's likely to be deeper. Um, anyway, I this, this glitch idea I wouldn't have found on my own if I'd just been sitting down thinking about it, or if I'd been writing a design document and getting someone else to program it for me. Uh, it was something I could only have gotten by, by writing my own broken, buggy engine myself at, at a low level, and, and by having a, a mindset that was open to unexpected influences. Uh, not, not that you shouldn't use someone else's engine, um, that I guess will just give you a different grain that will twist you in different directions, which isn't necessarily better or worse. But uh, the basic point is here is pay attention to your mistakes, because they can... You don't necessarily want to fix them, as Niflis was saying. They can reveal interesting things. Um, the other cool thing about code structurally is that when, when a program's running, it sits in memory as a, a block of data. And that, that's, that's highly structured, interesting data that you're only using for one thing. Why not use it for something else as well? Here's a game that generates levels by reading its own executable code from memory. So you, you, have, this, you have this structure, so use it. I've also gotten interesting results by interpreting sound, the sound that's coming out of speakers, as graphics. Uh, you know, like mu music visualizers do this. Uh, that's okay, cool. Um, yeah. So if you if you use uh, different hardware, then you, you change what, what the, the grain you're working with is. So you might, you might, might be able to do different things. Um, the easiest way to do this is by having just different input-output interfaces. The, the game Johann Sebastian Joust, I find a beautiful example of looking at a new control system and thinking, what's the simplest possible thing we can do with this? What's, what's the path of least resistance? What's the thing these controllers were made to do? even though the designers of them didn't realize that's what they were for. I've, I've been trying to do something similar with, with touch screens. It's, I feel like um, multiplayer on the same screen is what large touch screen devices like the iPad are for, even though it's not what, the, the, what Apple intended for them. Um, 
as, as, well as, as well as what materials, is what, what tools we use shape what we can create. There's a, a tool called Twine that's been getting a lot of attention recently, which is really good for making one kind of game. It does that really well. It's hard to do anything else with it, but it's, it's so easy to make things with that a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't make games have been doing cool stuff with it. Um, and the, the games often end up quite personal and they talk about, they, they feel quite claustrophobic often. Uh, I think that's uh, a pressure that the tool puts on it because you're typing out what happens in each thing. You don't want to put many different branches. So you're not likely to make an open world exploration game. You make something tight, twisted and dense. So the, the tools we use shape what we end up making. I've recently been obsessed with Vine, which which makes these short looping videos, and it's really limited. It, it, your videos only last a, a, a few seconds, and you can't take back mistakes, but I find that limit quite freeing. Um, it gives a lot of space for creativity. I, I've been trying to imagine how, how someone can make a tool that's like Vine, where it's the same simplicity and tactile, in the moment, acting, to, to create something that, that would be able to make games. I'm not, I'm not sure if this is possible. Maybe you just need a complex interface to, to, to make a, a complex system. But if anyone has any ideas, please make such a thing. But in general, if you, if you want to influence the future of games, then make, make tools that other people can use to make games. And you, you'll end up possibly causing hundreds of games to be made that, that wouldn't have otherwise. And that that's, can be more interesting than just making one yourself. Um, I think that's about it. <laughs>